Hey guys, it's Greg with Apple Explained, and today we're going to take a peek inside the secretive Apple Watch development process and the updates it's received since its introduction. This topic won last week's voting poll, and if you didn't get to vote, make sure you're subscribed. That way the voting polls will show up right in your activity feed, and you can let me know which video you'd like to see next. When Tim Cook unveiled the Apple Watch in September 2014, it ushered in a new era for the company since Apple had never made a wearable device before. And as you can imagine, it was no overnight project. In fact, the foundation of the Apple Watch stretches all the way back to 2002 when Apple's design team requested several high-end sports watches from Nike. Apple ended up receiving a couple different models, including the Presto Digital Bracelets and the Aluminum Oregon Series Alticompass. This may have appeared to be an odd request for Nike, but Scott Wilson, who was their creative director at the time, said, I was flattered that they were requesting them. We thought they were only personal requests, but their materials guy followed up with many questions on the materials and processes. They definitely drew upon watch industry techniques and manufacturing in their products since the first iPhone. This solid base of knowledge and experience experience in mobile devices eventually led Apple to giving smartwatches some serious thought. But before we get into the development of the Apple Watch itself, you might find it interesting that Apple sort of already made a smartwatch back in 2010, and it was called the 6th generation iPod Nano. Now obviously Apple didn't market this as a smartwatch, but this iPod Nano did include a variety of watch faces, and third party manufacturers actually made watch bands for it. So many users wore the iPod Nano on their wrist as a watch, and this became a popular trend among Apple fans at the time. And perhaps this further encouraged Apple to create a proper smartwatch since users demonstrated interest in that type of technology. Now let's talk about the early days of Apple Watch development. In 2011, Apple filed for several watch-related patents including a wristband which harnessed kinetic energy from everyday wrist movements in order to recharge its battery. Patents also suggested the device would include a curved touchscreen made from flexible glass, along with numerous sensors for monitoring exercise patterns and heart rate. And since many of these features were eventually included in the Apple Watch, we can assume the Apple Watch project was officially formed in 2011, shortly after Steve Jobs' death. During this time, Apple invited a series of watch historians to speak at their Cupertino campus, likely as a way to educate their employees and spark ideas for how their own smartwatch should function. Now the following year in 2012, rumors about an Apple smartwatch were already growing. Most of the speculation was founded upon a Chinese news site which claimed Apple was working on a new device with Intel chips, low power Bluetooth technology, a 1.5 inch touchscreen, and voice controls. And this information would turn out to be quite accurate, although no one was sure of it at the time. I should also mention that the Apple Watch was referred to as iWatch, both internally at Apple and externally by suspicious consumers. It wouldn't bear the name Apple Watch until its introduction in 2014. And when Tim Cook was asked why it wasn't named iWatch, Cook simply said, well, it, I, I kind of like the Apple Watch. What do you okay. think? Well, you're the CEO, so... Uh, <laughs> now, 2013 is when the Apple Watch project reached a big milestone. It was moved out of the experimentation phase and into official production. This meant Apple began investing more resources into the Apple Watch and had to prepare for mass production. And more suspicions about an Apple smartwatch were raised when an unnamed employee claimed Apple held discussions with their manufacturing partner, Holden High Precision Industry, regarding the production of a device that was neither a smart phone nor a tablet. Now because of all the chatter and anticipation surrounding Apple's potential smartwatch, some companies wanted to beat Apple to the market and position themselves as a pioneer in the industry. One of those companies was Samsung. They released their own smartwatch called Galaxy Gear in September 2013, and it was a huge flop. Only 800,000 units were shipped around the world, and we're not sure how many of those units were actually purchased since Samsung never released those numbers. But what we do know is that at least 30% of Galaxy Gear watches sold at Best Buy were returned by unsatisfied customers. Critics were also unsatisfied with the device. Some of their complaints included an uncomfortable, inflexible strap since some components were housed inside of it, its limited functionality of apps, an inconsistent notification system, and poor battery life. I think The Verge summed it up quite well when they said, as with industrial design, software engineering isn't among Samsung's strengths, and the results on the gear are a painful mix of unreliability and inadequacy. The unofficial Apple web blog compared the Galaxy Gear to the 6 generation iPod Nano, considering the 3 year old MP3 player to be a better, cheaper smartwatch than the Galaxy Gear because it wasn't dependent
dependent on a host smartphone or tablet and contained more features than the Galaxy Gear. Now by mid-2013, Apple had already filed for 79 watch-related patents and they registered the name iWatch in Japan and Russia. And during an interview at the All Things Digital conference, Apple CEO Tim Cook hinted at the possibility of developing a wearable device. He said, It's an area where it's ripe for exploration. Uh, it's ripe for us all getting excited about. I think there will be tons of companies playing in this. Now from 2013 to 2014, Apple began reorganizing and recruiting talent to aid in the Apple Watch's development. The reorganization happened with Jeff Williams, the company's senior vice president for operations, who was assigned as head of the Apple Watch project, responsible for overseeing logistics and planning with suppliers like Foxconn. And Apple recruited Angela Arendt, CEO of Burberry, as the head of their retail and online stores. And the health features included on the watch were made possible by two medical technology experts that that Apple hired. And finally, the vice president of sales for luxury watch manufacturer Tag Heuer joined the team in 2014. Now hiring all of these people with experience in the watch industry raised eyebrows in the tech community. Apple was essentially signaling that a smartwatch would be released and it was only a matter of time. In September 2014, the wait was over. Apple finally revealed the Apple Watch at the One More Thing event along with the iPhone 6 and iPhone 6 Plus. It featured Apple's single core S1 system on a chip and relied on a paired iPhone for location services since it didn't include GPS. Although it did include something called a linear actuator which Apple marketed as a taptic engine that provided haptic feedback in different situations like when an alert or a notification was received. The watch was also equipped with a built-in heart rate sensor, which used infrared and visible light LEDs in addition to photodiodes. Now one problem with a touchscreen this small is that you can't pinch to zoom, so Apple created the digital crown to serve in its place. With it, you could zoom in and out, raise and lower the volume, and scroll through menus. Another issue with small screens is that they can't display very much content at once, and Apple remedied this by incorporating something called Force Touch, where users could access extra features when they hard press on the display. Now let's talk about the specs. All versions of the first generation Apple Watch had 8GB of storage, but the operating system only allowed users to store up to 2GB of music and 75MB of photos. It also featured splash resistance, Bluetooth 4.0, a 450-nit OLED Retina display, a 520MHz single-core processor, and 512MB of RAM. Now there were a few different models of the Apple Watch. First, the Apple Watch Sport, which was aluminum and started at $349. Second, the regular Apple Watch, which was stainless steel and started at $549. And third, the Apple Watch Edition, which was gold and started at $10,000. But just one year later, Apple stopped selling the Apple Watch Edition in gold, opting instead for a nice ceramic finish that brought its price down to $1,249. Now you might be thinking, why did Apple even sell a $10,000 gold smartwatch to begin with? Well, it wasn't something Tim Cook supported. It was actually Apple Apple's chief designer Jonathan Ives who pushed hard to make the Golden Apple Watch a reality. He believed that in order to be taken seriously by luxury Swiss watchmakers, Apple had to create a luxury watch of their own. But the problem is that smartwatches eventually become obsolete, whereas mechanical watches last a lifetime. Now the Series 1 and Series 2 Apple Watches were released at the end of 2016 and provided some nice upgrades to the original. Both models added a faster 780 MHz dual-core processor, while the Series 2 had a built-in GPS, water resistance up to 50 meters, a second-generation OLED Retina display with 1,000 nits of brightness, and a larger battery capacity. Apple also added two new models, Apple Watch Nike Plus and Apple Watch Hermes. What made these models unique were their watch bands and watch faces that weren't available to other users. The next upgrade came with Series 3 near the end of 2017. These models added optional support for LTE cellular connectivity, which would add $10 to your monthly phone bill, Bluetooth 4.2, an altimeter to measure flights climbed, and 768 megabytes of RAM. Reception to the Apple Watch was generally positive with some exceptions, especially with the original release. Reviewers praised the watch's overall design and potential to integrate into everyday life, but noted issues of speed and price. Many described the watch as functional and convenient, while others felt it didn't offer as much functionality as smartphones had with their release. Farhad Manju of the New York Times thought the device had a steep learning curve, saying it took him three long, often confusing and frustrating days to become accustomed to it. 
But when reviewers compared it to competing products like Android Wear, they claimed the smartwatch finally makes sense. There was also mixed opinions on battery life. Jeffrey Fowler of the Wall Street Journal said the battery life lives up to its all-day billing, but sometimes just barely. Others complained that there just wasn't much to do with it. Tim Bradshaw of the Financial Times used the Apple Watch for a few days and concluded that there was no killer application so far besides telling the time, which is the basic function of a wristwatch anyway. There were also some issues with the Apple Watch heart monitor functioning correctly for people with tattoos since the watch flashed green LED light at the skin and recorded the amount of light that was absorbed by the blood. But under certain circumstances, like with tattoos or other conditions, the skin wouldn't allow the green light to be absorbed and therefore provide inaccurate heart monitor results. Now since its release in 2015, the Apple Watch has become the number one smartwatch in the world with about 24% of global market share and it generates billions of dollars for Apple each year. But it's interesting to note that the watch hasn't received a design refresh yet. It carries the same look today as it did three and a half years ago, and many are wondering how the Apple Watch will change when Apple does give it a new design. Will it still have a rectangular design, or will Apple go in the direction of the Moto 360 and create a circular Apple Watch? I personally enjoy the current design, although I'd appreciate a thinner profile since I have a tendency of hitting my watch on various things like doorways. But let me know in the comments what you'd like to see in a redesigned Apple Watch, and if you want to vote for the next video topic, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.